We've been to the Underworld in the past to do a few really important quests, but the Underworld is a fascinating place in and of itself. What's the full story of the Underworld? To find out, we're going to talk with every character who lives there. The Underworld is located inside the Museum of History at the Mall in downtown Washington, D.C. Beneath the ruins is a metro station. We find an escalator leading down. And patrolling outside is a ghoul with a rifle named Willow. Another human with a death wish. Welcome to the mall, tourist. Hey, I'm not a tourist. Come on, here you are in the mall of our nation's fine capital, taking in the sights, visiting the monuments. Face it, you're a tourist. All right, well, you seem kind of out of place among all these super mutants. Where did you come from? Nice to meet you, too. I'm the sentry for Underworld. City of ghouls, inside the museum. For a tourist, you're pretty clueless. My name's Willow, by the way. Wait, did you say City of Ghouls? Sure did. Underworld. It's right inside the Museum of History, then through the Big Skull. Most of the residents ain't crazy about humans, but they'll sell to you, fix you up so long as your caps are good and you ain't a ghoul hater. You're crazy to stand out here. Aren't you afraid of the super mutants? Those knuckle draggers? Nah, they don't bother us ghouls. Maybe they see us as kin or something, I don't know. Now there's other assholes. Yeah, you know, those humans like you. Well, maybe not like you, I don't know, but humans all the same. The Brotherhood of Steel guys with their testosterone and power armor. Those psycho talent company mercs. Those other assholes. All right, well, I'll be going now. Till next time, Sightseer. So super mutants don't attack ghouls? Since when? We've had Sharon in our party for quite some time, and he always gets attacked by super mutants. Maybe we can learn more about the ghoul condition by entering the Museum of History. Outside, we see that the museum looks far different from the one in our own universe. There are many interesting busts carved into the front, and a few banners promoting the Museum of History. The reception lobby is dimly lit. We have to turn on our Pip-Boy light just to navigate. And the ruin is mostly collapsed. The doorway to the right is completely filled with rubble. There are two bathrooms against the western wall. The men's restroom has nothing interesting inside, but exploring the women's restroom, we do find a copy of Nikola, Tesla, and Jew, which will come in pretty handy. None of the terminals in the center of this lobby work. They're all completely blasted out. And we see four large posters promoting the Museum of Technology. Experience life in an authentic Vault-Tec vault. See the actual Virgo 2 lunar lander. Marvel at the majestic cosmos in our planetarium. Well, that sounds like fun. We'll have to visit the Museum of Technology in a future episode. Heading through the door, we find a magnificent domed atrium. This is where the museum had some of their larger fossils on display. We see a mastodon to the left and a broken, collapsed Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton to the right. The legs are still mounted on the scaffolding supports, but the torso and head has since fallen to the ground over these past 200 years. This domed area was a central point connecting many of the major wings to this museum. To the right, we see a a big arch, 2052 to the present, the Resource Wars. The Resource Wars were an important part of Fallout history. One of the reasons so many things in the Fallout universe are powered by nuclear fuel, including cars and even home appliances, is because the world was running out of fossil fuels. Some of the only oil left remaining on planet Earth was buried under the Pacific Ocean, and the United States had a monopoly. They allowed Poseidon Oil to take over all of the oil rigs in the Pacific Ocean, and it was for this reason to gain oil that China invaded Anchorage, Alaska to take over the American oil pipelines. Sadly, we can't explore this wing because it's been completely caved in. Next to it, we find an arch that says 2066 to 2077, Alaskan liberation from the Red Chinese. Again, another exhibit I would have loved to have explored. We get to see the culmination of this struggle in the Operation Anchorage DLC for Fallout 3 where we can relive a simulation retaking Anchorage, Alaska from the communists. Sadly, this one is also completely caved in. On the opposite side of the room, we find a wing dedicated to World War II. 
1941 to 1945, American military might of World War II. Which of course makes sense because the divergence didn't happen until after World War II. So everything we would have found down this wing would have been the same as our own history. And then to the southwest, we find a pair of doors that lead to the history lower halls. As soon as we enter, we get swarmed by a bunch of feral ghouls. This is a great area to explore where we can find a bunch of relics, particularly about Abraham Lincoln, but since these are central to a quest about the Lincoln Memorial, we're gonna save everything that we find here for a dedicated video on the topic. Heading back out, all that remains is the entrance to the underworld. This is peculiar. We see a huge skull facade serving as a gateway to a primary exhibit against the northern wall. The reason this is here is because the museum was doing a big Halloween-themed event. They had a bunch of displays talking about the way different cultures imagined death and the afterlife. The poem Paradise Lost by John Milton, published in 1667, served as a central thematic element to this display. We're gonna find a lot of references to Paradise Lost once we go inside. The developers had a lot of fun coming up with the underworld. It was one of the earliest things that they envisioned for Fallout 3, and they spilled a great deal of ink coming up with concept art for the underworld. The exhibit is called Ages of the Underworld. We'll head on in to see exactly what this exhibit was all about. As soon as we arrive, a ghoul named Winthrop greets us. Oh, well, would you look at that? We got us a smooth skin visitor. Ooh, we, we ain't seen one of your type in a long time. Yeah, what are you? Now tell me, how is it you ended up down here in Ghoul Central without knowing what a ghoul is? Huh? You know, never mind. I'm a ghoul. Everyone down here, ghouls. That's what we are. And before you ask, what's a ghoul? Let me tell you. We're not the walking dead, despite the rotten flesh and the smell. We're mutants. Sort of. At least I think we are. Smooth skin? What does that mean? Smooth skin? You know, because your skin is so smooth and tasty. Relax, I'm just kidding. But I had you going, didn't I? Where exactly am I? You're in Underworld, Smooth Skin. It's the only safe place for we ghouls in DC. We're here out of sight and out of mind. The mutants leave us alone, and the slavers usually don't come this far into the city, so it's not bad. Really, the Brotherhood of Steel is the only thing we have to worry about. So long as we don't leave Underworld, that is. The Brotherhood of Steel? What's your beef with them? Bastards. They don't seem to be able to tell us apart from the super mutants. Or maybe they just don't care. They see us and shoot on sight. At least they have the common courtesy to miss most of the time. Still, bigots. So a whole city filled with ghouls, huh? That's right. As long as you don't bother us, we won't bother you. Feel free to come and go, trade, sleep, whatever. Just make sure that you leave whatever trouble is following you at the door. Because we don't want it. So enjoy your stay, smooth skin. Just try and keep from shooting up the place. We got a nice little deal going on down here. We'd like to keep it nice. Well, what do you do around here, Winthrop? Me? I keep every hunk of old rusted pre-war garbage around here in operating condition. We've got lights, water, and ventilation all running off the old crap they used to keep this place going for the tourists. I've managed to keep it going so far, but, well, I'm not sure how long I can keep it up. This is so fascinating. I can't bear to talk about this any longer. Hey, you asked. Don't blame me if you don't like what you hear. Actually, I do have a question. What's wrong? Why don't you think you can keep up with repairs? We've scavenged just about all the scrap metal from all the places we can safely get to. We're scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Hell, not before long I'm gonna have to disassemble poor old Cerberus for parts. Hey, you get around, don't you? Tell you what, you bring me back any scrap metal you find out there, and I'll trade you whatever I can. We can work out a trade. We've got some stuff around here that we don't need, but a smooth skin like you might make use of it. What sort of payment are we talking about? Well, we got stim packs, but the dock keeps us healed up so we don't really need them. So I could trade one of those for five bits of scrap metal. We also got us a ton of Rataway and Radex. I mean, what good is it to us? But I'll trade you either one for five bits of scrap. Your choice. I don't know, that seems like a lot of work. Why don't you take care of your own problems? That's a shame, stranger. A real shame. Let me know if you change your mind. We'll still need the parts. Well, on second thought, hey, let's talk more about that scrap metal again. Oh? 
Have you changed your mind? Are you willing to trade some scrap? Uh, no. No, I haven't changed my mind. Then why are we even talking about this? I'm very busy, you know. Hey, actually, I have a better idea. How about I do nothing, and you give me what you have? What? What are you talking about? Do nothing? Oh, I was just kidding. You've got a strange way of joking, stranger. Actually, I'm not kidding at all. How about you give me what you got, or I shoot your face off and dance in your brains? You... you wouldn't dare. I've got... I mean, I'll call for help. Go ahead and yell, Winthrop. I'll kill every last one of you. This is the last mistake you'll ever make. Help! Somebody help me! And with that, the entire city turns hostile. Well, this would make for a short video. We can't have that. So reloading a previous save, we can explore some of our other options. Instead of threatening the entire city, we can threaten Winthrop himself by saying, You'll be dead long before help gets here. Fine, fine, you asshole. I offered you a fair trade, and this is how it is. Here, take it. Take it all and get the fuck out. I never want to lay my eyes on you again, you miserable bastard. With that, he hands over ten stim packs, ten right away, but we lose karma. And Winthrop doesn't want to talk with us anymore. Again, we can't have that. Maybe he's got more stories to tell us. So reloading a previous save, we can say, sure, Winthrop, I'd be happy to help you out. Well, all right. That's good to hear, stranger. Just come on back to me when you've gathered some scrap metal. You'll find it just about anywhere. On junked robots, in old buildings, you name it. All right, I'll keep my eye out for scrap metal. But hey, what can you tell me about the underworld? We were driven underground, um, uh, almost 50 years ago now. Between the super mutants, the beasts, and you crazy humans, it's not safe up there. So we stay down here, out of sight and out of trouble. We get a few smooth skins every so often, but most of us don't trust them. You're not gonna give us more reasons not to be trusting, are you? Not only can we turn scrap metal in for chems, but Winthrop can repair our items, although his skill is only 61. Now, as we saw earlier, every member of the Underworld is armed, but the primary defense for this city is a hacked Mr. Gutsy named Cerebrus. That's it. <laughs> Civilian on deck. It's a fitting name of this robot in keeping with an afterlife theme of this place. Cerebrus is the name of the three-headed guard dog from Greek mythology who guarded the gates to the underworld, keeping the dead from leaving. Which is why in this case we can say, hey, so what are you? The guard dog? I am Cerberus. It is my solemn duty to guard the citizens of underworld against any and all threats, both foreign and domestic. So yes, I'm the guard dog. What can you tell me about the underworld, Cerebrus? This is a town full of peace-loving ghouls, so check your bigotry at the door. They're just like humans. They feel, they hurt, they bleed. They deserve the same love and respect as any human, and don't you forget it. At least that's what they programmed me to say. Personally, I think they're a bunch of rotting zombie maggot farms, and I'd send them all back to hell if I could. Damn this combat inhibitor! <laughs> the, the, so he has his own personal... This is funny because he hasn't been programmed by the pre-war military to hate ghouls since ghouls didn't exist really back then. So he must have developed this bigotry against ghouls on his own. Hey, Cerebrus, do you ever go outside? You know, into the wasteland? Negatory. I have been programmed to remain on premises at all times. In the event of hostilities, I will respond with deadly force. Go, underworld! Go, ghouls! Hey! Damn this pansy zombie programming. <laughs> All right, Cerebrus, you go do your thing. On the wall above the entrance door, we see two big banners promoting this big underworld event. At the bottom, they read, An exhibit on death and the afterlife. Turning around and heading into the main room, we see a skull on a pedestal on display, and a ghoul named Patchwork walks out of the nearby shops right in front of us. Huh? Ah! Jesus Christ! Don't, don't sneak up on me like that. Last fella, last fella to do that damn near lost my arm. You're new here, yeah. You must be since you're actually talking to, talking to me. I'm Patchwork, or just Patches if you like that. I'm, shit, I forget. Are you all right? Who, me? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I guess. No. Yeah. I'll be okay. I just... 
I just need to try not to lose any more of my parts this time. And Doc Barrows says that he's... He's getting tired of putting them back on me. So, you know, if you see any, just bring them back. You be careful, Patchwork. I don't want you hurting yourself. You sure? Some... Some people make me hurt myself. Because it makes them laugh. Oh, man, you're just disgusting. Yeah. And I ain't had enough liquor yet to think you'd... You're pretty. So you're the town drunk, huh? Why, yes. Yes, I am. And proud. Proud of it. I mean, if I weren't, I'd probably just spend a lot more time cry, cry, crying, you know? Here I am. Drunk. Falling apart. Literally. I lost my damn finger last week. Doc put it back on, though. Bless him. Hey, keep your parts to yourself, and let's talk about something else. Well, what... What do you want to talk about? Wait a minute, you're losing parts? Like, body parts? Yeah, it happens. A lot, actually. Actually. All the time. But I'm getting better. I think. Just keep an eye out for him. Not my eye. Those ain't never fallen out yet. Hey, watch out for your own parts, you creep. No, there's no need for that. For that. Wait, what were you saying? You wanted to talk to me about something. What was it? All right, I'll keep an eye out for your body parts. Really? You, you are all right. You should buy me a drink sometime. Now, what were you saying? Where can I get a drink around here? You, uh, seem like the right person to ask. Why, you want to head on over to the Ninth Circle and talk to Mr. Azrakal. He, he, uh, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, the generators. I don't know where they are. You'll have to ask Winthrop. Well, what can you tell me about the underworld? What can you tell me about Wait, wait, what? All right, well, I gotta go now. <sighs> Bye. So, Patchwork is less than useful. We see a big statue or something in the middle of the floor. Let's explore this, doodad. A bunch of the underworld residents like to sit on these benches around this thing. This is a twisted and fascinating sculpture. We see a big stone jutting out of the earth and looks like the souls of the dead are trying to climb it to escape the underworld. Their faces, well, the faces that are left anyway, are screaming in agony. And the lighting is great. The lights at the top give off the illusion that the surface is just just out of these souls' reach. They get a glimpse of sunlight, but they can never escape hell. The next character we're gonna talk with walks out of a nearby room. This is a well-outfitted fellow named Quinn. Oh, why, hello there. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Quinn. Oh god, I'm out of here. Suit yourself. I'll be here if you change your mind. Wait a minute, aren't you gonna tell me how rare it is to see a human in the underworld? Me? No, not at all. I'm used to your people. Truth is, I spend most of my time away from Underworld. Well, it's nice to meet you, Quinn. You too, stranger. I know a lot of people around here don't take kindly to humans wandering around, but I've met a lot of your people in my travels. Hey, do you happen to know where the Lincoln Memorial is? Yeah, just east of here. Bunch of guys with guns are holed up there. So Quinn is the Underworld's main link with the outside world. He goes out to find supplies, and the Fallout 3 strategy guide tells us that he is particularly protective of Tulip, the ghoul who runs the nearby shop, Underworld Outfitters. This shop is inside the old pre-war men's restroom, and we find Tulip behind the counter. Oh, a human. Well, hello. Welcome to Underworld Outfitters. It's... It's been so long since I had a customer. Her skin is rotting away and there's lots of bloody scabs everywhere. I need to find a new retexture mod for these ghouls. Hey, Tulip, what do you do with the money you make down here? Well, we spend it at Carol's or in the Ninth Circle. But I don't like it there. The rest we give to Quinn to trade for stuff we need whenever he goes out. Do you know anything about the Underworld? 
Well, yeah, there's a lot of old pamphlets and stuff down here. I've pretty much read it all. What was this place before the ghouls moved in? It used to be part of the Museum of History. The exhibit that used to be here was focused on what happens after death, hell, and whatnot. A lot of it was focused on this old book called Paradise Lost. It's about a guy who goes to hell. Pretty interesting stuff. I found a big box of copies of the book in one of the back rooms. Here, take one. Nobody around here wants them. And with that, we get a copy of Paradise Lost added to our inventory. We'll explore that in a minute. Hey, Tulip, how did all of the ghouls end up here? At first, it was just a couple people after the war. This was one of the only places that wasn't falling down or on fire after the bombs fell. I think that Carol is actually one of the few that were here then. But over the years, word got around. There had been ghouls living in little pockets all around. Not really so much anymore. Most of them either went feral or ended up here. I'm sure there are still a few out there, but anyone with any sense is in Underworld. Isn't it rather dangerous being this deep into the city? Not really. The super mutants leave us alone. I guess whatever they do that turns people like them doesn't work on us. The Brotherhood of Steel will fire on us if we're out in the open, but they don't bother us down here. We've had some raiders and slavers poke their heads in, but we've got Sharon and Cerberus and everyone else to take care of them. I guess when it comes down to it, being this far out of everyone's way is a good deal for us. All right, well, that's it for now. I'll see you later. Come back any time. It's kind of lonely down here. Tulip is a great little merchant. She sells a wide variety of things, including ammunition, weapons, even some railway rifle schematics. A great selection of combat and metal armor, all sorts of goodies. She's also a member of the Railroad. That's right, the very same railroad from the Commonwealth in Fallout 4. This may explain why she has the schematics for a railway rifle, but we'll learn more about her synth sympathies when I do my video on the Replicated Man. Now, we don't find the copy of Paradise Lost that she gave us in the miscellaneous section of our Pip-Boy like we find Daniel's scripture from Fallout New Vegas. Instead, it appears in the aid section of our Pip-Boy, which means we can consume it. Doing so increases our speech by two. I'm sad that we can't read it, but at least it's handy. Now, there's a lot to explore here in Tulip's little shop. Heading to the north side, we see that this is the old pre-war men's restroom. The urinals are still here, but she uses it for storage, and she's got her private bed in one of the stalls. She has a few containers, lots of stuff we can steal, and there is a big locker against the eastern wall, but it's locked, and it requires a key. We find a workbench by the sinks, and going behind the counter, if our sneak is high enough, we can hack into Tulip's private terminal. But here here we don't find any private entries, instead we find excerpts from books 1, 2, 4, and 8 of Paradise Lost. O Prince, O Chief of many throned powers, that leddeth embattled Seraphim to war under thy conduct, and in dreadful deeds fearless, endangered heaven's perpetual king, and put to proof his high supremacy. All right, don't worry, I'm not going to read them all. But I think it's pretty great that Bethesda included at least small excerpts from Paradise Lost in the actual game. Now, we need a key for that locker. I tried to pickpocket Tulip, but there's nothing on her inventory. I then went to her locked cash register, but inside all we find are caps. So then I went to her safe, but inside that all we find are caps. Which means that the only way to get the key to Tulip's locker is to kill her. On her body, we find her key, which allows us to open the locker. Inside the locker, we find pretty much her entire store inventory that we can now steal for free. But I'm not going to be doing any murdering in my gameplay. So reloading a previous save, we can head out of the shop and continue exploring. Turning left, we walk south past the big statue, where we find a bunch of underworld residents hanging around and talking. The air is off in the common house again. It stinks of sweaty death down there. I swear, every day it's something new. This place is coming down around our ears. Just try not to kill anyone while you're here. These guys are always complaining about the disrepair of this place and the smell. Sounds like even though they are ghouls, the smell still bothers them. Against this wall is the chop shop. 
It's rather disgusting when we find a bunch of blood lying on the ground right outside the door. Inside, it looks like some sort of infirmary, and what's this? Looking through the fenced-off window, we see two glowing ones just walking around. What are these things doing imprisoned here? There's a locked door against the eastern wall, and we find the guy in charge observing the glowing ones through a window. This is Dr. Barrows. Dr. Barrows, at your service. What brings you to that chop shop? Come to lend me a hand, I hope. I can always use fresh human samples. Stay away from me, you freak. That's just the attitude I've come to expect from most people. It's sadly what sets us apart. I'm not going to dissect you alive or tear out your entrails like in some lurid horror movie. All of my experiments are done by the book and scientifically. Touch me and I yell zombie. My dear friend, yelling zombie in Underworld would be like yelling sand in a desert. Pointless. Obviously you take no appreciation in what I am trying to achieve. Please leave me be. I have much to do. What do you even mean by fresh human samples? You haven't heard? I'm the foremost authority on ghoul evolution. I want to know what makes us tick. Something doomed us to this rotting form, and I aim to discover what it is. So, I need samples of human skin, organs, and other parts to make the experiments valid. Sorry, I aim to keep all my samples to myself. Pity. Well then, what can I do for you? As a doctor, he can heal us, fix our radiation, and he's got a small shop where we can buy some chems. Against the western wall, we find a woman lying either asleep or injured on a bed. This is Riley, of Riley's Rangers. We heard an emergency broadcast earlier telling us that Riley was here, and talking to her starts a quest that sends us to the Statesman Hotel. We're gonna tackle that in another episode, so for now, we're just gonna let her sleep. Next to Riley, we find Nurse Graves tapping away at a terminal, but she doesn't really have a lot to say. Welcome to the chop shop. I'm Nurse Graves, Dr. Borrow's assistant. Don't let our place's name fool you. The doctor is very good with injuries, dismemberments, and trauma. If you require any stim packs or blood packs, let me know. We can say, hey, I'm injured. Anything you can do for me? Certainly we can help you. Please speak to Dr. Borrow's. Oh, and we only take caps, no barter. But she is not a vendor, she just refers us to Dr. Barrows. Now on her desk near her terminal, we find a holotape. This holotape is called Wanted, Trustworthy Surgeon. And by listening to it, we start the quest, The Replicated Man. But since The Replicated Man is a fascinating and in-depth quest in its own right, we're gonna save that for another video after we talk to Dr. Zimmer at Rivet City. If we hack the nearby terminal, we see three entries that are really fascinating. They tell us a lot about the ghoul condition. The first one, examination of the post-necrotic human. We learn that after years of research, Dr. Barrows thinks that a ghoul's long lifespan comes from a mutation within the autonomic nervous system that only happens in certain people after they're exposed to specific combinations of ionizing radiation with wavelengths below 10 picometers. This mutation disrupts the normal process of decay in the neurotransmitters along the spinal cord. The transmitters, which are responsible for cardiac and respiratory function, are continually regenerated after the mutation, ensuring that they continue to carry sufficient oxygen to the brain to sustain the life of the subject. However, they don't carry enough oxygen to prevent their flesh from rotting. Skin cannot maintain its elasticity, and so it dies. He's calling this thing that some people have that predisposes them to the mutation that turns them into ghouls an X factor, but he doesn't know what this X factor is. He continues his research and theories in the next terminal entry, the Neurology of Luminous Necrotic Posthumans. That's his name for them. We know them as glowing ones. He describes the biological difference between feral ghouls and non-feral ghouls, as having to do with oxygen to the brain. The X factor allows enough oxygen to the brain and spinal cord to keep the heart and lung cells regenerating, preventing the ghoul from dying, but in the case of feral ghouls, it doesn't give quite enough oxygen to prevent their higher reasoning from deteriorating as well. In the case of glowing ones, Dr. Barrows thinks that their distinctive luminescence is due to a buildup of radioactive chemicals in the bloodstream and muscle tissue. In non-feral ghouls, the body's neurological system 
and will filter these particles from the blood and tissue, which is why they don't build up. But in feral ghouls, the system that filters these particles stops working, which over time causes them to build up until the ghoul becomes a glowing one. This seems to be contradicted by Nuka World, where we find Oswald, a sentient glowing one who can reason. Once a feral ghoul becomes a glowing one, after all of these radioactive chemicals build up in the body, their personalities change. Instead of just seeking out enemies to devour like a typical feral ghoul, they start to seek out wounded feral ghouls so that they can heal them. Dr. Barrows doesn't know yet how this healing effect of theirs works. And the final one, study of the ferocious post-necrotic dystrophy, is all about the brain structure of a feral ghoul. He again repeats his theory that the X-Factor only allows cells capable of maintaining motion to work in feral ghouls, but that in non-feral ghouls, the X-Factor mutation also extends to their higher reasoning. Without the ability to reason, a feral ghoul reverts to its primal need to feed, which is why they attack and feast on humans. He doesn't exactly know what can cause some non-feral ghouls to turn into feral ghouls over time, but he guesses that it may have something to do with the isolation of non-social ghouls. He thinks that being isolated from other human or ghoul company can exacerbate the situation and turn them into feral ghouls. But of course, this guy hasn't yet met Billy, the ghoul child in a fridge. Well, that was a fascinating terminal entry. Again, these are just Dr. Barrow's opinions, so we don't really know if this is how ghouls work in the Fallout universe, but it's one of the best theories I've read. Now, heading on over to the eastern door, we can crouch down and pick this thing to avoid detection. Heading around the corner, sure enough, we end up right in that room where Dr. Barrows is keeping his two test subjects. Here we find two glowing ones, and they're named. One is Ethel, and the other is Meat. Thankfully, they're not hostile. Dr. Barrows doesn't seem to notice us through the glass, so we can take the opportunity to try and pick this safe. It's a very hard locked safe, you need a skill of 100 or more to pick it, but if we do, we just find some caps, some scotch, and some stim packs. Be careful. All right then, I think that's a good idea, Sharon. Let's head on out, buddy. All right, come on, Sharon, I want to close this door. Dogmeat's got the right idea. Sharon, come on. Fine, I'm going to close this door and leave you here. Bye-bye. Heading out of the chop shop, we can turn left. Against the western wall, we can go through a door. This is Winthrop's room. We find another holotape on this desk, labeled a request for help. Like the last one we saw, this one is also involved in the replicated man quest, so we'll save it for later. We can hack Winthrop's terminal to learn more about what he does here. But inside, we just find some notes that he's written on the Underworld's electrical system. The system needs a new fuse box, it's leaking air, a relay fan is busted, he has to reroute one because it's just messed up, another junction possibly caught on fire, he's gonna check it out later. Something stinks in junction AC67, a mole rat maybe? AC88 is missing some parts. Oh, all of them. The entire junction is just gone. Poor Winthrop trying to keep this place afloat. The final entry allows us to unlock the nearby wall safe where we find a 10 millimeter pistol, some ammunition, and a small amount of currency. Heading out and turning left, the last room to explore down here is the women's restroom. Inside we find a bunch of mattresses on the floor. Looks like this is where the underworld residents sleep. With that, the bottom floor is explored. So heading up the steps, we can turn left to enter the Ninth Circle. The Ninth Circle is a bar and restaurant run by the ghoul named Azrakal. It's named, of course, after the Ninth Circle of Hell in Dante's Inferno. This is the circle of hell where all of the traitors were kept, which is quite fitting once we learn more about Azrakal. Azrakal's personality. I covered Azrakal and the Ninth Circle in my video on Sharon. This is where we found our companion Sharon. You can watch that video by clicking here. After resolving that conflict, we'll find Sydney and Mr. Crowley in here sometime. Remember, we met Sydney in the National Archives, and we met Mr. Crowley when we did the quest, You Gotta Shoot Him in the Head. I did videos on both of those places, and I'll link to them in the description below. On the wall here, we find a painting. This is a real world painting. This is a painting called Map of Hell by Sandro Botticelli. It depicts all of the circles of hell from Dante's Inferno, making it quite a fitting painting for this particular pub. It's a unique painting in Fallout 3, we only find it here. Heading outside the Ninth Circle, we find a big room with a bunch of ruined displays. Statues, paintings cut away from their frames. There is only one painting remaining, and this is a real-world painting. This is an oil-on-canvas painting called Dante and Virgil in Hell, painted by William Adolphe Bogaru in 1850. 
In this painting, Dante and Virgil are the onlookers visiting the eighth circle of hell reserved for falsifiers and counterfeiters. The two we see here are Capoccio, a heretic and an alchemist, and Gianni Scacicci, who stole the identity of a dead man in order to fraudulently claim his inheritance. Capoccio is the man being bitten in the neck by Gianni. The ruined version we find in the game misses out on all of the gruesome detail in the original. I wonder why this is the only painting in this room that remains. Standing next to this painting, with some entrails on the ground, is a ghoul named Snowflake with white hair. Is this a wig or is that his natural hair? Oh. Oh. Hey, look at that. A human with hair. Hey, you think we can do something about that? About what? My hair? Yeah, man. That's what I do. I cut hair. I know, I know you look around here and there ain't a lot of work to show off, right? These corpses only got half a head of the stuff, so I never get a chance to work on a full head. Come on, no charge. You stay away from my hair. Oh, come on. I don't ever get to work on an actual human. I'm good. I promise. I'll take a few puffs and I'll give you the best haircut of your life. No charge or anything. It'll be fun. Hey, wait a minute. Are you taking Jed over here? Well, yeah. So, what else do I have to do except get high? You think that I need to be sober to cut a ghoul's hair? Half the work is cutting the skin off. These guys don't care how they look anyway. They just humor me. How did a ghoul end up as a barber? I prefer stylist myself, but whatever works for you. Everyone has a gift, you know? I used to live in Rivet City. Folks there had enough money for me to do okay. But after I, uh, changed, no one would let me touch them. I ended up here. Of course, a ghoul with a barbershop makes about as much sense as a screen door on a submarine, so... Fuck it. I just took up Jet. At least it passes the time, you know? All right, I'll let you cut my hair. All right. A full head of hair to work with. What should I do? Next to Snowflake against the western wall is the last stop on our tour of Underworld. Carol's Place is a combination restaurant-bar-hotel. This is where Mr. Crowley sleeps, and the cornered-off bed to the right is the bed that the Lone Wanderer can rent from Carol if we want. We find Carol manning the shop, but on display on a wall near her cash register is another real-world painting. This is a painting of the ghosts of Francesca di Rimini and Paolo Malatesta appearing to Dante and Virgil from Dante's Inferno. Dante and Virgil are on the right. This was painted by Dutch-French romantic painter Ari Scheifer in 1836. Virgil and Dante meet the couple depicted here in the second circle of hell reserved for those who go to hell for lust. This couple is trapped in an eternal whirlwind, doomed to spend eternity swept up in this whirlwind just as in life they were swept up by their carnal passions. Now, Carol is a really interesting character, one of the most interesting characters in all of Underworld. She was also a central figure in the quest we needed to complete to gain Sharon as a companion, so I showed most of her dialogue off in my video on Sharon, and again, I link to that video in the description below. I'm not going to go ahead and recount it all here. In short, she is one of the only residents of the Underworld to remember the bombs dropping on the Capital Wastelands, and one of the first people to seek refuge here in the museum. She has spent over 200 years here. At some point, a woman named Greta showed up, and the two of them became partners and opened up this restaurant together. She also adopted a boy named Gob, but he left the Underworld to go seek fame and fortune. We, of course, meet Gob in Megaton, and after initial introductions, he tells us about his time with Carol at the Underworld. A place called Underworld. It's a ghoul city down in D.C. I set off up here to find adventure and fortune, and, well, I found this place. I'm sort of stuck here. Colin says that I can't leave until I pay off my debt to him. Of course, he charges me room and board, too. If you ever get to Underworld, Tell Carol that I said hi. But we also know that Moriarty abuses Gob. I can't talk about that anymore. Moriarty will beat me again if I do. Gob is scared of his boss Moriarty, so he stops talking. But to learn more about Gob, we've got to talk with the prostitute working out of Moriarty's saloon, Nova. Hi there. I'm Nova. New to Megaton, huh? Do yourself a favor and keep walking. Some of us stay for a few days, and then it's five years later. Hey, what's the story with the ghoul over there? Who, Gob? 
<laughs> well, if you can get past how he looks, he's a sweetheart. Colin's awfully hard on him, though. Where did he come from? He don't talk about it much, but apparently there's a whole city of ghouls somewhere down in D.C. He's mentioned his mother a couple of times, but other than that, he won't really say. He's been here for, oh, I guess about 15 years now. Ever since Moriarty bought him off those slavers. Do you ever, you know, work with him? With Gob? <laughs> well, he's sweet, and, and I know that he'd like to. It's just, well... I don't want to sound shallow or anything. I mean, I'm a whore. My standards aren't exactly high. But there are places even I won't go. Johnnies that are squishier than me are one of them. Why is Moriarty so hard on Gob? Well, the miserable bastard is hard on all of us. But Gob gets it the worst. I guess just because he's different, you know? Despite what Nova says here, we get the impression from watching Gob and Nova interact with each other that they're really close, possibly even lovers. Nova has a lot of pity for Gob, and that pity has grown into romance. Sometimes in their casual NPC dialogue, they'll talk with each other about going into a back room for some private time, and sometimes Gob will talk about getting some wine that the two of them can share together alone. She also refers to him using some sweet pet names. And if we decide to kill Moriarty in our game, Gob and Nova take over the saloon and run it together. He as the proprietor, and she stops being a prostitute. I walked around the this place for probably an hour trying to capture this dialogue on film, but sadly it never happened. But once we meet Gob, we can go back to Carol at the Underworld and ask her if she knows about a guy named Gob. Gob? Yes, of course. He's my son. Well, not really. Not like you would think of a son. We ghouls don't really work like that, but I love him like he's my own. Do you know him? Have you seen him? Is he all right? Now we have two options here. We can tell her the truth, but hide many of the harsher details about Gob's reality. And we can simply say he's working at a bar in Megaton. Oh, that's wonderful news. I'm so glad. If you see him, please tell him that his mother misses him and loves him and that I hope he's happy. But he shouldn't come visit it's too dangerous. No, no, he should stay put where he is. Or we can give her some of the more sad details of his life and say that he works for a guy in Megaton, but we think he might be a slave. That's, that's terrible. But at least I know he's alive. So that's something. If you get up that way again, tell him that I said I miss him and that I love him. But he shouldn't try to escape. It's too dangerous. No, no, he should stay put where he is. I couldn't bear the thought of him getting hurt. Strangely enough, even when Carol tells us to tell Gob that she loves him and misses him, if we go back to Gob, we don't find any dialogue options to tell him that we met Carol. Now, the final cast member of Carol's place is Greta. We learned from Carol's dialogue that Carol was absolutely miserable until she met Greta, but then the two of them became partners. We often find Greta having a smoke break right outside the front gates to the underworld. Sorry, I'm on a break. I'll be back in a bit if you need some food. But she won't talk with us unless she's working. So if we wait until the proper time, we can go back to the underworld to talk with Greta. Now, if we play a female lone wanderer, Greta gets jealous. Hey, I saw you over there talking to Carol. She's friendly, isn't she? But don't you get any ideas about her? Got it? Good. Now do you want something to eat? What do you know about the underworld, Greta? To tell you the truth, hon, I don't really know much about it. All I know is that it used to be some sort of exhibit. Something about hell or the afterlife or something. Tulip knows that sort of stuff. Not like anyone around here ever buys anything from that shop of hers. What's on the menu? If you're lucky, maybe it's gone rancid already. Mmm. -hmm. Ah, oh, come on, don't tell me that these ghouls like to eat rancid meat. Ah, oh, that's disgusting. We learned from Azrakul's terminal that Greta was jealous of the affection that Carol gave to Gob. It may be that Greta's jealousy led to Gob leaving. And if that's the case, then I think this may be a rather unhealthy relationship. 
Now there's one final piece to the underworld that I'll briefly mention but I can't cover just yet. Once we've completed the primary quest in the game and if we have the Broken Steel expansion installed, then in the lobby just outside the gates to the underworld, we find a ghoul named Griffin trying to sell some sort of magical drink that can cure ghouls. He calls it the Amazing Aqua Cura. But seeing as how I've been focusing on all of the side quests of this game, he hasn't appeared in my Museum of History yet. The quest itself is fascinating and it deserves its own video, so we're gonna save that topic for another day. And with that, we have fully explored the Underworld. If you're interested in the other stories related to the Underworld, remember I've got those videos linked in the description below. As you can see, I'm setting us up for a bunch of great content for Fallout 3. We're gonna be tackling Riley's Rangers, The Statesman Hotel, Rivet City, The Replicated Man, a whole bunch of stuff. I publish a new Fallout video spanning all of the games six days a week. So if you wanna make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.